I grew up believing that Kashmir is indeed an integral part of India and come from a very progressive family and my political background considering my parents and how I grew up in Hyderabad. I think it's so deeply embedded amongst Indians that Kashmir is an integral part of India. One, because of the kind of propaganda that the government has undertaken over a period of time and its policies regarding Kashmir. And it took me all these years, even when I went in 1980 to Kashmir where my father was a visiting professor. I went believing that and I was very proud to be in a place which is, you know, being so close to paradise on earth, that kind of feeling. And then I went back 20 years later and I must say I was shocked. I was shocked because as a woman, as a citizen of India, as a activist, as a researcher that I had entered Kashmir, it actually shook me fundamentally and I think it changed me and my perception of the state and what it really means when you say this part of our country is integral to us or it is not. And it became very clear at the first go when I arrived there after 20 years that my gosh, you don't treat your own people in this manner. It is not integral, it is occupied. It was very clear. Never have I seen this kind of, or witnessed, this kind of catastrophic, what should I say, suppression of people and what they suffered at the hands of the military and the state. So I think to me things became very clear regarding the constitution of India, regarding the role of the state, regarding me as a citizen of India because I began to question myself on all these things. So I think things became clearer to me regarding nationalism, what it is meant when the government talks about national security and things like that. So Kashmir, I think, is something that I've learned a lot from. And my whole perception and understanding regarding these issues of the role of the state, the people, or is it a territory that you are after? And why is it considered that these people are almost an enemy to you. I think the whole project of nation state itself is responsible very largely for what we see happening in Kashmir. Because had it not been for that, we would have probably approached it very differently. We thought more in terms of territory rather than the people. Uh, and our attempt to foist uh, the, the, this whole uh, nation state project on a people unmindful of what their aspirations, their concerns are, or th even bothering to take them on board, I think has contributed to, in a way, creating the kind of psyche that we see today, which is pro it's more or less indifferent to uh, what happens. I mean, if you go by what uh, the army chief uh, just a day or two days back said, it becomes very clear that uh, he regards even um, unarmed stone pelters uh, as, as uh, anti-nationals and uh, akin to terrorists. And uh, so if the project is to save the nation state, these anti-nationals can be neutralized, annihilated. I mean, it's as simple as that. And nobody winks an eyelid. That's why you don't see any mass protests taking place anywhere in the country or uh, have seen in the last 27 years anywhere in the country because Indians were not bothered. Let's take the army's army doctrine itself, which uh, subconventional warfare, which is counterinsurgency doctrine of the Indian army, uh, which spoke of this, uh, that the basic objective is to transform the will and attitude of the people, which is a very coercive attempt. I mean, when you're talking about will and attitude of the people, uh, and it's the army talking about it, it's very clear that they mean how f through use of force uh, and fear, uh, instilling of fear, you bring about this transformation of will and attitude, which is reprehensible. But it calls for a question. Why is it the army feels that the will and attitude of the Kashmiri people have to be so transformed? Because it seems to be a consistent uh, uh, 
policy of the of successive Indian governments that there can be no political solution. As Kashmir is concerned, we have seen there has been no attempt at any political dialogue, any political initiative from any sides, which leaves only one possible uh, option open for the government of India, use of military suppression to suppress a popular movement. It is as simple as that. So, if you want to bring about a transformation of will and attitude forcibly because you have no desire, no will to actually initiate a political uh, resolution of the conflict which has affected us for the last uh, seven decades, then ipso facto you leave option, uh, you leave it open to the army and army is trained to behave and act in a particular way. The only way the army can, can works is to kill or get killed. I mean that's the job. Their move to fight the so-called internal enemy where the Kashmiris have been transformed into the enemy, the other, uh, they'll use all, man, all means and measures to crush the movement. What can we do about it? Very simple, that we have to keep on asking questions. Why is this? Why is it when the, when the army chief said that, they, uh, that the only uh, possible course of action that, that, is, that, that, that the army believes is, uh, it should take is harsher measures? And that's the way one uh, the operations have to be conducted. He is making clear that there is it's going to be a no holds bar military suppression that is going to be that's going to be uh, the order of the day. And therefore, we have to decide if we believe. As Seba began by saying that we grew up, we have been brought up into thinking that Kashmir is an integral part of India, territorially only, not as far as people are concerned. We really don't give a damn for people. Otherwise, uh, we would be out on the streets protesting against the kind of atrocities that have been committed against them over the last 27 years. Our hearts were not moved by it. Uh, pellet guns and blindings of children, arrests of children, detention of children. The, these are things we don't bother about because the national the national uh, security, the nationalism that is guiding us blinds us to all these things and we don't give a damn. So it's only the territory we, we care about and we want to protect. As long as we, as living here as Indian citizens, if we are indifferent, in fact, it's not just indifference, I think we are actually colliding and we are coalescing with this whole regime of impunity that is all pervasive. So I think we need to take those steps where we at least begin to question the government by saying, is this okay if you believe they are your own integral, this is an integral part? Is this how you treat the people? You know, there are some very interesting questions that when you meet people, whether they are young, old, irrespective of gender, age, class or caste. This is one of the things because I have in my 16, 17 years there, I have never seen this kind of rage against India as I have seen there. And it's very understandable. I feel ashamed at times because it brings into question a lot of things about how come I belong to a women's movement. I'm an activist there. And one of the first questions that came to my mind is, oh my gosh, how come we have been so silent when this kind of suffering has been brought upon people by a deliberate policy of subjugation, humiliation, threat, intimidation. Talk about it. It's all there. And to me, I think I was very moved, the kind of insecurity in the name of national security, in the name of all the laws that have been passed there. I think the lawlessness of the state is something that really strikes you there. It's very interesting when young people raise questions about India and people living there and saying how come when uniformed men are raping women, there are mass rapes happening, there is sexual torture against men, how come nobody opens their mouth? And it's a very valid question coming from a people who do not give up their resistance, who are resilient. And I think this is something we as people also have to learn. You know, when the Mathura case, rape case happened, when Ramiza B, that was custodial rape. If you remember, you people are maybe not born there, but then, but I think the entire country, there was an impact 
about these rape cases and in fact it led the women's movement and all other people who were concerned about it to mount such a campaign that we had to there had to be amendments to the rape law you know this is the kind of movement and i think it becomes it's it's very necessary that we as women activists as researchers as people who are living here and connecting to people of kashmir jammu kashmir uh while we can't compel the corporate media uh to to be to be professional and to be to be uh, to be honest uh, and to show intellectual integrity uh we can uh who uh, are not part of the corporate media uh we can by ensuring that the language which we use is different that we don't use the word terrorism when we are talking about the movement there or the militants there it's as simple as that because terrorism has come to acquire uh, a pejorative sense to it which was not there earlier uh remember bhagat singh at once upon a time was also declared to be a terrorist so the, the, so terrorism i mean the words have acquired a meaning terrorism has also become a euphemism for anti national uh, uh traitor uh so these associations make it compel us to be very careful in using the same terminology that the official dam and its their cronies do in the corporate electronic media or in the print media we have to be careful about what language we use so when we are talking about kashmir we not only use the, the, to try to exercise some uh, 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 restraint on a language also the questions that we pose every time for instance the debate since last two days after the army chief made the statement is about the impact that his statement is going to have on the kashmiri psyche the point nobody is asking is that this has been a situation for the last 27 years after 27 years especially in light of last year's supreme court observation which raised some very fundamental question for instance they said how is it that it takes for the normalcy to be restored for which the army and the armed forces of the state are called central paramilitary forces are called in aid of the civil administration that it takes decades for the normalcy and even then it doesn't happen so there must be something basically wrong with this approach they said now this is the question we should also be asking that why is the army uh, once again after 27 years having declared i mean every umpteen times the government the pro propaganda machinery of the government and its clones in the in the society have come out and constantly harped on the theme that people are coming out in hordes and voting everything is hunky dory militants are just handful pakistan is on 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 uh, uh, on the back foot etc etc and then again the situation reverts back to the same old scenario where we hear of militancy rising infiltration rising killings taking place everything now it doesn't make sense i mean there was a time in 90s when the number of militants was 10000s today by all official accounts the numbers have shrunk to less than 200 probably yet the same military force and the same level of deployment is kept and the same language harsh language and threatening language is used by the generals i mean what is happening why are we reverting back to a position which was there in 1990 isn't there something wrong with the policy then that the army chief has to come out after 27 years of military operations in in kashmir which only means that the that the military military suppression has failed it has failed miserably and it cannot succeed there can be no military solution forget about the present army chief i mean he seems to be an hawk but there are other generals who have served in kashmir who after retirement and even during their their service they used to caution through their statements and bring to the uh, to the fore the need for a political initiative because they used to say that we can only do so much the rest depends on polit politicians to decide why is it 
that we never ask the questions from our political masters. Why is it that in the last 27 years, after deployment of armed forces, after all the impunity that has been provided, we are back to square one every now and then?